Man up. Stand up. Have some damn pride in yourself. What happened to you? What happened to you? We were strong. We were powerful. We were principled. And we weren't easily pushed around. Thank you for watching the Winston Marshall Show. It is my pleasure today, not only to be in this beautiful convent church in Jaffa, in Israel, but to be joined by Douglas Murray, a man who on the streets of Israel absolutely needs no introduction whatsoever, a celebrity. I don't think you can walk down the street without getting stopped. Um, but for anyone who doesn't know, uh, an esteemed journalist, columnist at The Spectator, Telegraph, New York Post, an author of books, The Strange Death of Europe, Madness of the Crowds, Madness of Crowds, I should say, and War on the West. Douglas Murray, thank you so much for speaking with me. Thank you very much. It's a great pleasure to be with you. I'm sorry that you've um, explained where our location is because I was going to say how nice it was that you've come to my home. <laughs> um, so obviously we're in Israel and this is a post-October 7th world and, and it's, it's, it's the Israel-Hamas conflict that has brought you here. Hamas is Operation Alexa flood that on October 7th killed 1,000, 1,200 Israelis and 253 people taken hostage. You've been here for a few months reporting, uh, doing media across the world, going to the Gaza tunnels, I understand, going around the country. I wondered if you could tell us if there was anything, aside from the obvious reason that you're a journalist, but anything that compelled you specifically to come here to Israel for this conflict? Well, I've been in Israel for most conflicts since uh, 2006, where I, I was here during the uh, Second Lebanon War. Um, I've come here many times in peacetime as well. Uh, I wanted to come here as soon as I could after October 7th for several reasons. One was that I believed that it was necessary to see what had happened and to see what was happening. I had an intuition that we were going to see um, two things in particular, uh, which I think have panned out. One was that the world was going to move on from October 7th immediately mm. and on to what Israel was doing in response to October 7th. And that was pretty much a story from October the 8th. Mm -hmm. It wasn't what had happened. It was, uh, what are the Israelis doing? Mm -hmm. The world is always fascinated much more by what Israel does in response than in what is done to Israel. I mean, that's the case even with, you know, rocket fire of the kind that is, just goes on all the time here, uh, even in non-conflict times. Uh, you, you know, rockets are fired from Gaza, Israel fires rocket back, rockets back, and, mm -hmm. uh, you know, the international media says Israel fires rockets into mm -hmm. Gaza. So I knew that, first of all, that was going to happen. And the second thing was I sort of got an idea early on that we were also going to see, as we have done, um, uh, denial, uh, denial of the atrocities. And I mean, that happened from the day, it happened from the day after, yeah. as ever uh, with people who hate Israel, they simultaneously uh, deny the atrocities and revel in them. Uh, they celebrate something they also diminish. And so in that situation, as you well know, it's best to see things with your own eyes because at least then, when they say, as people do, you know, this didn't happen or that didn't happen, you can say, no, I know, because I saw it with my own eyes. So that's partly why I'm here. It's kind of astonishing to think, to imagine what it would take for these people who are denying it. What, what, when would they actually believe? We've seen most of the videos from October 7th mm. were on social, well, maybe not most, but certainly a lot of them a lot, were yeah. on online we saw mm -hmm. them we hamas were gloating about yes it. what would it I, and we see also that we know what the hamas charter is mm. we now again with the the war on the houthis in in the red sea their literal charter is god is the greatest death to america death to israel a curse upon the jews victory to islam and on the streets of london yemen yemen make us proud mm. turn another ship around mm. i can't imagine what it would take for that to 
Well, those people are beyond reason or persuasion, of course. I mean, those people are uh, enemies. They are enemies of Israel. They're enemies of Britain. They're enemies of America, enemies of the West. Uh, if, if American, British, and other ships are attacked by Houthi rebels, um, uh, why would you be chanting in support of mm. the Houthi in, in London? Only if you hate the city you're in, the country you're in, the society you're in. And there is a significant number of people who that's the case. Um, I think there's a larger number of people who are just very easily persuadable, who are very, very ignorant, and hadn't ever heard of Houthi until a couple of weeks ago, mm -hmm. and now have become wild experts on them. Mm -hmm. But it's the people in the middle. It's, it's the non-fanatics, non-psychopaths, the non-dogmatic Islamists, just enemies of the West, who are the ones who are persuadable. Um, people who celebrated the massacres and really loved them, as there are many people in Britain who did and who said so on the streets and are still saying so, uh, those people I'm, I'm not interested in, really. They're enemies, um, and that's that. I mean, it's like... Even if they're British? Oh, yeah. I mean, it's not my fault. It's theirs. You know, if... if if you glory in the death and slaughter and the murder and the kidnapping and, and beheading of Jews, um, I don't regard you as being the best of British, you know? Mm. And, um, and I think we're taken wild advantage of by such people. But there is this large group of people, and I think, that's, I think this has shocked a lot of people, particularly in America, where I spend a lot of my time, who um, they're shocked by the fact that there's a younger generation there who really do seem to be taking the cause of Israel's enemies up as a sort of, as I said recently, their generation's free Tibet. Mm -hmm. um, they think free Palestine is the sort of cool thing to call for. Mm -hmm. uh, they have no concept of what they're talking about. Um, you know, when somebody says from the river to the sea, either they know that they are calling for the end of the Jewish state, or they don't know which river it is, and they don't know which sea it is, and they probably couldn't guess. Well, I want to come to Britain, but one thing I've noticed whilst being here, now being in London, we're here all the time, from the river to the, to the sea, and there's no conversation about a two-state solution. What I've been really struck about here, mainly with Israelis, is that they also aren't talking about a two-state solution. No. And, and, and for me, I brought that up, and I felt anachronistic doing so. It's like... Oh, I, I kind of, I, it's a dated opinion. And, yes, and yes. even Netanyahu has said he, he wants total control of that region from the river to the I, sea. I, I, would, I would say not, you don't need to say even Netanyahu. Um, net, people might expect Netanyahu to say that. Uh, it's more striking that all of the Israeli left, everybody you speak to in this country, I've spoken to people who are lifelong leftists, lifelong peace now, mm. people who were employing and working with Palestinians from the Gaza. Mm -hmm who see no future in this so-called two-state solution. Mm -hmm. And th I think the rest of the world needs to catch up on that. Mm -hmm. um, there are a lot of anachronisms about the world's opinion about the country we're sitting in, and lots of just wildly out-of-date, defunct views. The two-state solution was a mantra for a certain type of politician in the West for some decades. But picked up in the 2000s after 9-11 when people wanted to find the sort of solution to the Middle East problem. And they would, they would call it the Middle East problem. And I'd always say, well, which problem are you talking about? This region is replete with problems. Oh, no, it's the Israeli-Palestinian dispute. And, and, you know, sensible, moderate people, the sort of David Milibands, the, 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 the Camerons, these sorts of people, would say, you know, well, the real thing that needs to be sorted out is a two-state solution, the solution of a founding of a Palestinian state alongside an Israeli state. And the thing is, there's sort of two problems with that. One is the idea that if the Palestinians actually had a state called Palestine, um, that would not mean that the economy of Yemen boomed. Mm. It would not mean that the Saudis made great or greater leaps forward in human rights. It would not mean that the mullahs in Tehran would stop killing girls on the streets of Tehran and other Iranian cities. Mm. The idea that the whole of the region is held back because a small population who the Arabs and 
Persians and others in the region really don't care for, the Palestinians, that they're waiting for them to get a state in order to sort of improve themselves or sort of make themselves more reasonable members of the international community is palpable, demonstrable, obvious nonsense. So that's the first thing. The second thing is that the reality on the ground has just changed, and it's changed for several reasons. One was when the Israelis disengaged from Gaza in 2005, five, six, and I remember it very well, and I remember the very uh, fervent debates in this country as well as around the world, and the pressure from the Republican government in administration in America to you know, withdraw every Jew from Gaza and hand the Gaza over to the Palestinians and have free and fair elections in mm. Gaza. Well, uh, you know, the Palestinians promptly uh, elected Hamas, who then killed their Palestinian brothers and sisters who were from rival groups like Fatah, threw them off buildings, shot them in the back, dragged their corpses around behind trucks around the Gaza in a celebration. Uh, that was an early sign, I would say, that the two-state solution was in trouble because they'd been given a state in Gaza. Mm. And, you know, there were left-wing politicians, many of whom I spoke to, who, you know, they said at the time, you've got all of the infrastructure we left, the international community will give you money, we will give you money, um, okay, you're not going to be able to uh, um, control your airspace, for instance, but you build Singapore. And they didn't build Singapore. Uh, the leaders of Hamas enriched themselves and their sons, and they bought expensive penthouses in Qatar and around other parts of the world. And they built a tunnel system that's the world's biggest tunnel system. And they launched rockets repeatedly at Israel. And then on October the 7th, they had this big breakout through the fence and massacred people in their homes and young men and women at a party, among other things. Mm -hmm. And um, so anyone who thinks that the Palestinian state, the sort of two-state solution thing is obvious, first of all, has to contend with the fact that they were given a state. Mm -hmm. They were given a state. And they made it a terror state. And there's no reason why Israelis should have to live beside that any more than we in Britain should live beside a terror state or Americans should live beside a terror state lobbing rockets into them all the time. And then you have the problem of the West Bank. And the West Bank is a big problem because I was out the other night again uh, there. And you can see from the bits of the West Bank, which many people think in a two-state solution with the West Bank would be given to the Palestinians, you can see the lights of the city we're sitting in mm. at night. Mm. And it's not just that it's within rocket range, it's within artillery range. Mm -hmm. So the city we're sitting in, if the Palestinians were given more of a state than they have, and they actually have a quasi-state in the West Bank under the control of the Palestinian Authority, if they were given a state, there's no guarantee at all that they wouldn't do the same. In fact, it's almost certain that they would do the same which means that the entirety of Israel is at constant, not just threat, but likelihood of constant bombardment from every direction, from rockets, RPGs, break-ins, um, and much more. So it's intolerable. And I think that the rest of the world has not realized this. That, and it's, it's not just intolerable for the Israelis for this demand. It's, it's something we wouldn't tolerate. I mean... The idea that you would reward, I mean, like a Secretary Blinken was here again the other day, and he keeps up this thing of, you know, this is why we need to double down on the two-state solution. First of all, you're singing a dead song. Mm -hmm. And secondly, why should, why should the reward for October the 7th be a gift of another terror state to the Palestinians? I don't see why. But as I say, that's, a, that's common opinion in Israel across the political spectrum. But the rest of the world hasn't caught up. And I worry about that disjunct. Does that mean that your vision of the future of this country is kind of a constant conflict? Well, I don't have a vision for the future of this country. It's not my place to have one. I think that Gaza has been an insoluble problem and the international community has given it to Israel to solve. Mm -hmm. I don't see why Egypt shouldn't help mm -hmm. solve the problem of the Gaza. They share a border with it. Egypt used to own the Gaza. Give it to Israel to give it to Egypt to solve. Mm. And if 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 you were to say that, people say, "Well, we don't want the Palestinians." That's what Sisi and Co. All, uh, all we don't want them. 
Palestinians brought terror everywhere they went, everywhere they went, where the PLO went, where Yasser Arafat went, everywhere they went, they brought terror, mm -hmm. whether it was Egypt, Jordan, Tunisia, mm -hmm. Lebanon. That's why, so the Jewish state keeps on being told, solve this insoluble problem. Mm. Is there a final status solution? Not at the moment there isn't. And as the center-left president of this country, um, Prime Minister, uh, President Herzog, said to me the other week when I interviewed him, he said, at the very least, it's not the time to talk about it. Mm. You know, it, it, would, it, it would be like um, asking America immediately after 9-11 to cede territory to a terror group. But it is the time to talk about how to defeat Hamas and, yes. and Israel have made it clear that their objectives, of course, are to, to take back the hostages, but also to annihilate Hamas. Mm. Aside from the, the militant Hamas terrorists, how, as much as Hamas is an idea, an ideology, I've heard you say it can be defeated, mm. like Nazism was defeated, mm. like Imperial Japan was defeated. Like communism was defeated. But was communism defeated? Well, largely. It's still pretty alive. And, and universe, Marxism is certainly a very popular ideology. It is. But uh, think back to when we were growing up, how much stronger it was. Um, I mean, the Eastern Bloc, uh, much of Europe was under communist control when we were growing up. Um, the Soviet Union was you know, a major power in the world. Uh, but go back a couple of decades before that, and it was rolling out across the world, the communist ideology. It's not gone, um, but it's certainly not got the strength it had. In the same way that Nazism hasn't completely disappeared, it's pretty rare, but you get the odd little group of well, weirdos. China is communist. Well, there are Marxists that in our country, mm -hmm. in America. It's Compared to Nazism, it's a completely yes, different story. Yes, that's true. I mean, well, that's because, that's because of course, as, as we, everyone knows, everyone who knows anything about history, um, the, the rightful moral taint that not, not just Nazism, but fascism had after the Second World War meant nobody wanted to be near anyone advocating that again. Because of all sorts of interesting historical reasons, um, there are always some people trying to bring back the communist ideal. Mm. Sure. Um, nevertheless, I mean, it's an idea that's it's taken a heck of a beating. Uh -huh. um, I mean, there are still ignoramuses around who think, you know, <laughs> it never worked anywhere, but let's try it again. Uh, it well, never, never provided for the societies, but it will next time. Okay, you can always find some really slow learners and wicked people who do that. But, but I would argue that, uh, that the idea has been very considerably defeated. Um, and even in China, you can't call it exactly communism anymore. They call it communism, but if you, you know, it's, it's open to debate, at least. Hamas is, yes, an ideology. It's very similar to all other jihadist ideologies. It's very similar to ISIS. It's very similar to Al-Qaeda. It's very similar to all forms of millenarian Islamism. Um, but Hamas itself is a structure, it's a group, mm -hmm. um, it's a party, it's uh, um, an entity. Uh, you can destroy that, you, know, you can kill the leadership of that, and that's what the Israelis are currently doing. You can kill the leadership, but it's an ideology that's, or it's a group that's got now more support, according to some polls, in the West Bank, not well, the case in, Hamas, in Gaza. Yes. But it's, it's almost like the, the more victorious, or the mm. more that Israel do destroy them in, in Gaza, the more popular, it's like it reinforces the ideology. Yeah, there, there's a problem with this, and we heard it after 9-11 as well, which was some people said you can't, defeat, you can't defeat terrorism without creating terrorists, which is a logical circle, mm -hmm. because that means all that happens after you're attacked is you just sit back and yeah, right. say, okay, I mm -hmm. won't do anything in case I create terrorists, mm -hmm. which I don't think is the best policy. Um, what you say about the West Bank, your Palestinian opinions about uh, Hamas there is true, but it's been true all the way through. The reason why Mahmoud Abbas is currently, what is it, 16 years into his four-year term is because they can't have elections in the West Bank, not because the Israelis won't let them, but because the Palestinian Authority can't have them, because otherwise the Palestinians in the West Bank will elect Hamas. Mm -hmm. um, of course, the the people who hate Israel in the West Bank 
um, will be likely to celebrate any, you know, perceived victory against the Zionists, uh, as they would call them. Well, yeah, but what's Israel's answer to that? Just not mm -hmm. attack Hamas? Um, I don't think that's possible. I, I, I think that and, but I think the question underneath your question is 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 the really tricky one, which I don't have an answer for because the answer that was there was trodden all over from mm -hmm. 2005, which is, you know, a very interesting distinction between that, that exists that is worth reflecting on is that you know there's a difference between psychopaths and sociopaths. Psychopaths are probably born. Sociopaths are made. Mm. Gaza is a an entity filled with sociopaths. I say that with confidence because 18 years, which is the time that Hamas has ruled Gaza, is of course precisely the length of time of a young man or woman's education. Mm. Hamas has had control of the education of Palestinians in Gaza for 18 years, mm -hmm. and it has created a generation of sociopaths. Well, it's worse than that. Even UNRWA have also yes. been entered, and we've seen what they're giving the kids in, in Gaza. It's UNRWA. It's it's UN entities that you and I and other Western taxpayers have all paid mm -hmm. for, who have not policed the school textbooks in Gaza, did not stop them teaching the children not how to thrive in a potential mm -hmm. Singapore, but rather how to kill Jews, and that the best thing you could do with your life was to kill a Jew. So that was them. Um, all the UN aid agencies, UNICEF, was meant to look after children, didn't even bother, didn't even bother to try to get hold of the kidnapped Israeli children or even get updates on mm -hmm. them. They didn't, it took months for UNICEF to even come to this country. And the one thing that UN aid agency is meant to do is to protect the well being of children. And they didn't. They didn't. They did nothing. And that's our tax dollars mm -hmm. at work. Again, every international aid agency and others failed. Why is it when you're in Gaza, every second house has weaponry in it? Every school has weaponry in it. Every mosque has weaponry in it. Every hospital. I mean, they say the Shifa hospital. It wasn't a hospital. It was a command headquarters mm -hmm. of Hamas where they tortured people and held prisoners. Um, all of this was done under the watch of the United Nations, under the watch of the international community. How can anybody in Israel trust the international agencies or the international community not to allow that to happen again because they allowed it to happen? I'll give you another example, if I may, very quickly. We, I mean, we need to get onto the North probably at some point, but I've spent about a certain amount of time in, uh, as well as in Gaza in the, um, in the territories in the north of Israel on the Lebanon border, where there's quite a lot of activity at the moment. Um, uh, both sides are shelling each other, uh, incursions into Israel from Hamas as well as uh, Hezbollah. Um, I was there the other day. I saw the footage of, uh, you know, because you might say the 2006 war ended with an agreement that the international community would police the southern part, the south mm -hmm. of the Litani River, the border of Israel and Lebanon, would police it to make sure it didn't become a sort of another weapons buildup that meant we'd have another war in the Lebanon. Um, 18 years on, or whatever, 60, 17 years on, Hezbollah has amassed about 160,000 long-range missiles in Lebanon, in the area that the international community was meant to make sure didn't get militarized. And when I was up there the other day, I saw recent footage of Hezbollah firing rockets into where I was. And the UN cars driving along the so-called demilitarized zone as the rockets were going off. And what did they do? They just U-turned and went back. Tell me this is the United Nations doing something. Like, tell me that Israel should trust the international community mm. to safeguard the people of this country. It's a joke mm. and a really expensive joke because mm. we're all paying for it. We've been paying for it for decades. People in the West have to realize we have been rinsed mm -hmm. by these people and misled by them. So if somebody says, well, what are you going to do? 
uh, to ensure that the next generations of Palestinians are not made into sociopaths in Gaza, I'd say, make sure every nation in the world who says they care, make sure they're not. Make sure they're actually educating the children. Make sure that they're actually making sure that aid gets to the people. Mm -hmm. But do you see any willingness to do that? I haven't seen it to date, so why should anyone expect it from now? Mm -hmm. And then if you're talking about the international community, look at what happened in, in The Hague at the International right. Court of Justice only the 11th of January, where South Africa took the case of genocide against hmm. Israel. About what's it was going paid on. to do that by Iran, of course. Huh. Iran used South Africa as the litigant at the International Court against Israel. Mm -hmm. And uh, Kel fucking surprise, Jeremy Corbyn was in attendance amongst... Oh, of course. Uh, uh, I, I mean, this ties into what we were saying earlier about the, the problem in Britain taking how Brits are on the streets. It seems to me there's a whole faction there of um, people just completely who do not understand the, the, what's going on. Um, I don't think that is the case with Jeremy Corbyn. He does understand. He's just on the other side. I mean, it was the same with the IRA and Jeremy Corbyn. He did understand. He was just on the other side. He was on the side of Sinn Féin IRA throughout that conflict. Are you sure? I mean, oh, if yeah. you were to ask Jeremy Corbyn about Israeli history, I don't think he'd, he'd have the slightest clue. Well, I mean, I'd love to ask him. He's, but... um, without getting too nasty, I mean, he's a very stupid man. And you can tell the sign of a very stupid man, which is somebody who says the same thing for decades with a slight weariness, as if he has to keep saying it, and if he keeps saying it enough, it's going to happen. You know, these sort of banalities, like, you know, that's why we need to fight for justice and peace, and, along, and, and um, that's why we need uh, to tackle um, all forms of hate, this sort of thing. Now, what does that even mean? No, uh, and by the way, just to go back, that yes, this was a man who just after the IRA tried to kill the elected Prime Minister of the United Kingdom, invited the leadership of the IRA to the House of Commons. That wasn't because he was a peacemaker. Jeremy Corbyn was nowhere near the peace process. Never, ever been near any peace process. He was not involved in peace in Northern Ireland because nobody would have trusted him to be because he was so obviously on the side of Sinn Féin IRA throughout. Okay, it's the same with him here. He's on the side of his friends, Hamas and Hezbollah. He is not a peacemaker. Now, there are other people, Islamists on the street. When you say people on the streets of Britain, I really always want to reiterate this point. These are not the British public. They are Islamists, people who take advantage of our country and seem to hate it and bizarrely enough moved to our country. I, I can't understand yeah. that. Like if I, <laughs> if I moved to a country, it would generally be because I liked it. Um, but it's people like that. It's a few residual communist types, malcontents and others. The British people can't be like that. They're not like that. And the, more people went on the Countryside Alliance March in 2000, 2001 than have been on any of these demonstrations in London in recent uh, months. And I think that's really important to keep in mind because a lot of the world sees what's happening in our country of birth and they just, then they say to me, they say, what has happened to Britain? And I have two answers. One is it is really serious. It is really serious. And secondly, that isn't Britain. Mm. That does not speak for Britain. And I think both of those things are worth keeping in mind. So are you hopeful that Britain can be salvaged? Well, um, I think so, but it would require a massive change of tone and a change of leadership. And, and not, it's so strange. I mean, British politicians are so odd. I mean, I've watched them all my life. I've known quite a lot from all sides. And many are driven by very good instincts. Many are driven by a genuine sense for public service. But they are also uh, creatures of the wind. You know, they do, for some reason float where the wind blows them. Mm. And the, the reason I think we've had a generation of pretty supine politicians on this is that they are, they are basically herded like a herd of sheep by very angry sheepdogs mm. who nip at, and sometimes savage people at the side of the herd in order to make the herd behave in a certain way. And we've seen that in recent months as well. 
you know, people's post bags get filled with complaints from their Muslim constituents and others about Israel, and they start to worry about it. Well, if you ask any MP, by the way, um, one of the things that they get most in their post bag about foreign policy is Kashmir. Hmm. Yeah, because there's a lot of people in Britain from the Indian subcontinent yeah. who also are very, very exercised about Kashmir. I've not heard any politician talking about Kashmir. No, and hmm. I've seen no protests on the streets particularly. But hmm. you could be fairly certain that if an Indian-Pakistan war, for instance, kicked off at some point, there would be hell on the streets of Britain. Yeah. Well, I mean, that's, that's just the consequences of mass immigration. Um, if we'd imported millions of people from another part of the world, I mean, this happens. It happened recently in, uh, where was it, in, uh, in, in London, with some Eritreans fighting other Eritreans. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I mean, I don't see why Eritrean politics should play out in fist fights on the streets of London, but it wasn't my decision to import a lot of Eritreans to London. But as I always say, if you import the world's people, you do import the world's problems. I'm a bit more pessimistic where, so Oct I've, it seems to me that Oct October 7 might be just another, to, to use your language, moment where Britain and Europe continues on its strange death. Yes. It's just like add it to the list of, the Manchester attacks, London Bridge attacks, uh, mm -hmm. Lee Rigby, Reading attacks in 2020, so David Amos. Yes. Hartlepool, there was an uh, asylum seeker killed a man, uh, a pensioner in Hartlepool. Uh, that the was, end of last that year. was disappeared as a story. Yeah, that's completely fast. gone. Yeah. Um, and it's just another, we sort of another case that we're going to just ignore and mm. kind of continue in our well, merry way. I think there's a reason for that, which is the, the question a politician would ask, well, has asked me has said to me in private about that is, well, what would you do about it? Hmm. Right. What would you do about mm -hmm. it? Now, that's, a, that's a, a pretty big question to have to answer. Um, one answer I give when people say that is, well, I didn't create this problem. And again, you created a problem and you're telling other people to solve it or you're saying it's insoluble, or let's pretend it didn't happen. I mean, I was very struck by, um, I, I think you went to the site of the Nova Festival, mm -hmm. didn't you? Um, I was very struck by the fact that I've spoken to a lot of survivors of the Nova Festival and the families of people who were killed there. And it, it haunts, it, of all of the atrocities of October 7th, it's one of the ones that haunts me most, because I sort of think, I know a lot of people who could have been there, mm -hmm. not just Israelis, but an international circuit party, I know a lot of people mm -hmm. go to those. And like the ones at the Nova Festival were just incredibly unlucky that they met Hamas that morning. Mm. But sometimes people here in Israel have said to me in recent months, you know, what would you do if that happened in your country? And I say it did happen in my country. Mm -hmm. It happened at Manchester Arena. Mm -hmm. But what was the British response to it? Much to my fury, what was the British response to it? It was, don't look back in anger. And as I've said many times, I don't see why you shouldn't look back in anger if 22 young girls are blown up by a suicide bomber who'd come with his family from Libya because they'd fallen out with Gaddafi. Mm -hmm. I don't think that my country should be the retirement home for jihadists who've rowed with Colonel Gaddafi. I think, sort it out amongst yourselves. But, you know, we imported that family and then um, their son detonated a suicide bombing at an Ariana Grande concert. And, and, yeah, the British response was don't look back in anger. But why was that the response is a really interesting question. Mm -hmm. And I think the answer is because, again, the, 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 the question was what are we going to do about it? Mm -hmm. I was asked that by a very senior figure in the, mili in the, um, in the military, in the um, media. Um, in that period, because I was furious about the way in which the media was reporting it as well. Um, and I, this, this person said, you know, we're missing the public, aren't we? We're, we're missing the mood. What do we do? And I said, yes, yes, you're missing the mood, because you've gone straight on to the kind of one love. Mm -hmm. Well, that only works if you've dealt with your enemy. Um, and we in Britain just sort of, you know, the inquiry into the Manchester Arena attack discovered that a security guard who saw the bomber didn't, thought he was suspicious, 
saw him acting suspiciously. He was carrying a large rucksack with what turned out to be a large explosive in it. And the reason the security guard didn't report the young man was because he looked Muslim and the guard was worried he'd be accused of racism or Islamophobia. Mm -hmm. When people say, why do you care about these things? I say, because it actually kills. Yeah. Okay. This so-called political correctness and things, it actually kills. Yeah. It's not a harmless pursuit. If there was a more appropriate attitude towards all of these things, a more realistic attitude towards these things in Britain, in America, in every other Western country, there would be people alive today who are not. Mm -hmm. Three of those people are Lucy Lowe, Becky Watson, and Laura Wilson, who were all killed by grooming gangs. They should be household names. Everyone should know their names. George Floyd is a household name. Mm -hmm. These three white British girls who were killed because they were white by the grooming gangs, I, I even have to look them up. Right. And the media, doesn't, the media does very, very little actually in reporting on that. Mm -hmm. I mean, a friend of mine a few years ago started doing a book on the, 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 the so-called grooming gangs, in, uh, the rape gangs in Britain. And um, he, actually, he actually didn't get around to writing it. He said it was just the whole thing was too depressing. Mm -hmm. But one thing he did say to me, which I was very struck by, was he said he thought when he went around interviewing the victims, the thousands of victims of these gangs, of mainly Muslim men, he was struck that he thought that the people who were interviewing, the victims, would be kind of talked out. Mm -hmm. Far from it. Nobody had talked to them. Mm -hmm. The media had never knocked on mm -hmm. their door. So, look, this is why I'm, more pe I'm pessimistic. The policing, the media, the politicians are going to you saying, I don't know what to do about it. All the institutions of Britain mm. are hapless. Yes. So I'm very pessimistic about where this is going. Well, one of the things that people quite often think is there'll be a kind of wake up moment where people realize actually it what can't go on. What on earth is that going to look like? If right. October 7th wasn't a wake up moment, if Manchester Arena wasn't a wake up moment, Right. With all these girls being killed isn't a wake-up moment. What, what on earth is it going to take? Well, here's what people do. Uh, I mean, I, th I thought there were lots of times I thought, maybe this is it. And then I started to think, actually, no, nah, no, nah, this won't be it. This won't work. Yeah. Um, I thought a British soldier being beheaded on the streets of London would make some impact. Nope. Mm -hmm. I thought David Amos being killed by a jihadist would have an impact. Look at the debate that his colleagues did, the, 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 mm -hmm. um, the session in which Parliament reconvened to pay tribute to their fallen colleague. It was as if David Amos had died of a heart attack mm -hmm. from natural causes. Mm -hmm. None of them. Some of them talked about the online harms bill because they said things like, you know, people write mean things about us MPs. Okay, well, mm -hmm. people write mean things about everyone. Yeah. I'm not downplaying the threat to MPs, but uh, there's a lot of hate online. Um, but they were talking about the online harms bill. They, David Amos wasn't killed by the online harms bill. He was killed by a guy who had also stalked out Michael Gove's house to try to assassinate him and to murder him. And this, this young man, was it Ali Harvey Ali? They, I mean, I, I was just, I thought, what a, what a disservice, what a disservice, what a deep disservice to your colleague that you would not acknowledge the reason he was killed. And by the way, when Joe Cox was murdered, in equally brutal circumstances, it wasn't the case that the House didn't want to identify the killer or what might have motivated the killer. In fact, as I well remember in 2016, there was a period where almost everyone who was voting for Brexit was being accused of being complicit in the murder mm. of Joe Cox. If somebody said, for instance, every Muslim in Britain is complicit in the murder of David Amos, you would have howling. Mm -hmm. And by the way, I think it would be wrong. Of course they're not. But they couldn't even identify the strand of ideology that had led to the murder of their colleague. And that's MPs. Mm -hmm. These are elected representatives. And this is one of their own, killed in the most brutal fashion by somebody who then sits by the body proudly. Mm. And they don't have the guts. They don't have the... And what is that? Cowardice. Cowardice and a total inability to think of how to address the problem. Mm -hmm.
because David Amos was not killed by a one-off crank. He was killed by somebody who has an ideology which is rampant across the West, which is rampant in the region we're in, which is covering the Gaza and the West Bank and much of the Muslim world. Mm. So it's not, and, and, the, and as I say, apart from cowardice, then it's a thing of, why don't you recognize this? And, the, and we then would come back to that same thing, which is what are you going to do about it? Mm -hmm. And there have been times when I thought, there was one time when I thought it might shift in Europe. And that was the, uh, the days after the Bataclan. Again, when people say, well, how would you react to the Nova Festival in Europe? I say, the Bataclan mm -hmm. was, was the closest we've had. And um, there was a moment then, I remember Jean-Claude Juncker and Angela Merkel went very quiet for about three days because they were waiting to see if the attackers had come from the recent migration from the Middle East and North Africa. And if they had have done, I think there would have been uh, serious, serious consequences in Europe and against them politically, for sure. Mm. But they just managed to survive it by the fact that the terrorists on that occasion were Belgian and French-born. They had come for training in Syria, and slipped back into Europe through the migrant routes. But uh, yeah, they, they just, the, the train just missed some mm -hmm. of the European politicians. But still, by the way, in France, the discussion on what we're talking about here is much more advanced than it is in Britain. Where is it at in France? Oh, well, I mean, left-wing politicians in France say everything I say. Huh. And, um, and I mean, they all know there's a problem, because how could you not? They don't all know what the solutions are, and they don't all suggest very many solutions, but, but they all know there's a serious problem. I don't think the British authorities do. Mm -hmm. There's another, um, as well as the media and the politicians, there's a civil service, and you've just been... Mm -hmm. Uh, you've been brought into a big story about the civil service. There's been a whistleblower named Anna Stanley, and this is pretty rare because civil service are under NDAs, so they mm. can't speak out. She's come out, and she was made to do some sort of counter-terror uh, training mm. at King's College. In London. In which, not only are we told that uh, she, well, she heard conversations where people thought the PREVENT program was Islamophobic, but also, your name came up as long, mm. uh, 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 along with your friend Joe Rogan. Yes. It seems to me that the civil service is another, you know, call it the blob. In America, they've got their version of it, the deep state. Mm. Uh, how concerned about the civil ser service are you? Do, you? do you think that this is another, another sort of thing that needs to be taken apart? And, well, and I, I mean, it, it just needs a massive shakeup mm. and one of the big critiques that I and others have of the Conservative government is they've been in power for 13 years and this has all happened on their watch. Yeah, quite. You know. Um, there was a, you know, I mean, it's, it's, it's such a, such a historic failure. Mm -hmm. Can anything be done to change the civil service? Oh, yeah. I mean, of course you could do things. Fire people, fire a lot of people. Mm. Um, uh, for instance, I've, I've said this before in print, but I want to know who let um, a, a man called Mohajarani, who was the former deputy prime minister of Iran, I want to know who let him into the UK in 2002. Mm -hmm. um, he is, by the way, the man who wrote the book justifying the Ayatollah's fatwa on Salman Rushdie. And mm. he lives in Harrow, leafy Harrow. Still. Yes, still. Yes, still. Yeah. Now, First of all, that man should be arrested and deported. Uh, Salman Rushdie, one of our leading novelists in Britain, had another attack on his life 18 months ago. I don't see why Britain should be better capable of protecting the man who justified his murder than in protecting mm. Salman Rushdie. I, mean, I want the names of the officials who allowed Mahajarani into my country, and I want them fired and preferably prosecuted. I want the people who allowed in the Manchester Arena bombers' family into the UK 
to be fired and preferably prosecuted. I want names. Now, I'll t tell you why. If this went round in another direction, if this was any other problem, there would be firings. Look at what happened with the Windrush scandal that was suddenly became like the biggest story in the UK about some people who'd come to the UK, had lived in the UK long enough, should have had citizenship. The Home Office made a, it made a muck up about the whole thing. And it was a huge scandal. Everyone said heads should roll about it. Why shouldn't heads roll in the civil service over allowing in Hamas commanders? Who was it in the civil service? Who was it in the Home Office in Britain who allowed Mohammed Sawalha to get British citizenship? One of the things you're meant to do, he's a former Hamas commander in the West Bank, military commander, not one of the lovely welfare Hamas people. Um, who allowed Mohammed Sawalha to move to our country and to get citizenship when, among other things, if you sign to become a British citizen, you have to say that you're a person of good standing? You can't be a person of good standing if you're a military yeah. commander of Hamas. Who let him in? Why are these questions never asked by the media, by government, by the Home Office? So all of these Home Office officials and others, they muck up all the time in grand ways that lead to the deaths of British mm. subjects on British streets. And they never have to pay. They have not yet paid once. It's in that context that officials from the Foreign Office, from the Home Office, from the Ministry of Justice and the Ministry of Defence are sent on a three-day training course at King's College London led by pseudo-experts. By the way, there's a whole... Are we allowed to swear? Swear away. There is a whole world of bullshittery around the so-called counter-terrorism area. And the man who defamed me and William Shawcross, who is his government's appointed prevent reviewer, um, he is an example of it. These are people who, they, they do this total horse shit. It's like these sort of social science nonsense where they, you know, oh, what are the steps to radicalization? Or there are four steps to radicalization. These are people, the, the man who defamed William Shawcross and Joe Rogan and me, um, he argued a little while ago in one of his little red articles that that Islamist extremists are not motivated by Islam in any meaningful way. It's more about being lonely and things. Well, you know, I know a lot of lonely old women who don't become Alu Akbar suicide bombers. I know a lot of people who seem quite lonely in Britain. It's amazing to me they don't all strap on a suicide belt. I don't, I don't know where you live in, in the UK, but I mean, it, it's, it's, uh, there are a lot of people who feel left out. I bet if you went to certain yeah. towns in the north of England, you meet an awful lot of people who feel kind of left out. It's very striking they don't join ISIS, isn't it? I wonder why. Mm. I wonder why. So there's this whole pseudo-science, scientization of terrorism studies, and it's really not that difficult. It's really not that difficult. And, they get, and these civil servants get put on these courses. And, of course, what really happens is they're all cowards, they're all led by cowards, they're all led by this horse shittery about, you know, alleged counter-terrorism expertise by non-experts. And they duck the Islamist one, and in fact, one of the striking things about Anna Stanley's whistleblowing was there was a girl in the, in the home office who apparently on the course uh, joked about the fact that her brother had joined ISIS. You know, I reckon if, if there's somebody in the home office whose brother has joined ISIS, that person is also a security risk. Mm -hmm. Right, definitely, mm -hmm. definitely a security risk. Um, but they, they gloss over the Islamist thing. They say Islamists aren't, they aren't uh, propelled by Islam or by their faith in any way. Nothing that could give that. It's all about being lonely or, uh, you know, not getting exactly the job you wanted or not making the local cricket team or whatever. But what they call the far right, I um, mean, this guy, this, this non-entity guy, Newman, he... Um, yeah, he, he, he was asked about Joe Rogan and me. And Joe Rogan, as you know, I mean, a very well-known far-right figure. I mean, he's, he's, a, he's a typical Nazi. <laughs> like all those that, other Bernie boys. Yeah, yeah. yeah that, he's a, he's, uh, that Bernie Sanders supporting libertarian <laughs> podcaster, he's, he's, he's planning the Fourth Reich if ever I saw one. Yeah, yeah. I mean, um, it's preposterous. Mm. And this, this idiot uh, was asked by somebody, well, what do we do to suppress... Um, Douglas Murray and Joe Rogan, because if you suppress them online, they, somebody said, you know, then 
you know, they've got large online followings. And the answer was, well, society will have to find other ways to suppress them. Mm. Well, I regard that as being a pretty sinister threat as it happens. I'm a big boy, and Joe Rogan's certainly a big boy, and can he can really look after himself. He's a cage fighter. Um, but I would like to know what that means. What, what's the plan that this government-paid um, non-expert, what plan has he got to physically suppress me? And if he doesn't mean physical suppression, what kind of suppression does he mean? It's the sort of thing you'd expect to hear in East Germany before the fall of the wall, mm. not in Britain not in my country. It's outrageous. And I would like, once again, I would like heads to roll at the Home Office and at the Department of Justice and at King's College London, by the way, which is in receipt of tens of millions of pounds from Qatar, which is also the funder of Hamas. I would like people to be fired. It's the same with these councillors in the north of England who all knew about the rape gangs. The police who all knew about the rape gangs. And very occasionally one of them will say, in this, it, there was a woman in, in o leafy Oxfordshire had a rape gang of Muslim men raping young girls locally. And when that came out, the head of the council, the, who had previously been in charge of like children's, you know, policy in the Oxfordshire area, does a, pre does a, does a piece to camera where she apologizes. She said, very sorry for the breakdown in services in the Oxfordshire County Council during the years 2005 to 2015. Uh, wow. We'd strive to do better. This sort of thing. You'd think it was somebody apologizing for leaves on the line on the metropolitan line. Not yeah. the mass gang rape of girls. For racist reasons, by the way, remember. For racist reasons. People who say they care about racism care about the racism that these girls were selected because they were white. Mm -hmm. But this is what we get in Britain. We get these weak, pusillanimous, never taking a, a, a responsibility, overseeing things, and there's never a cost to them. None of these people should have a job. None of them should have a pension. They should be hanging their heads in shame. But for some reason, they just glide along. I'm, uh, so Hizbut Tahrir have just been, the, 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 the Home Secretary has just made it a prescribed terrorist group. For me, I see that, and like you, I want these people arrested. I have absolutely no hope that they will be arrested. I have no belief. I have no, there's nothing that encourages me to think mm. that anything will actually be done. So yes. it's, a, it's a great for you to say, I want these people arrested, but yeah. is there actually any indication that anything will be done? I mean, it would only, so. only be done if, if there was pressure from the top to do it. I mean, that guy that Piers Morgan interviewed, who's the head of Hizbut Tahir in the UK, who's a GP on the NHS, yes. Um, he, uh, um, I mean, he obviously now the group's been banned. He should be arrested. Um, will he be? I'm not holding my breath. But he should be. He should be in prison right now. Mm. A member of a banned terrorist group. Mm -hmm. um, I, but I mean, by the way, that one. I mean, you, wow, talk about slow learning. I mean, I remember after the seven seven attacks in 2005, Tony Blair said that he would ban prescribe his book Tahir which is a really low-hanging fruit. Yeah. I mean, many Muslim countries have banned them. You know, they're banned in Pakistan, they're banned in Egypt. They're not actually the most dangerous jihadist organization, but they're very, very nasty, and they shouldn't be operating in the UK. Um, but, you know, Tony Blair said he'd ban them. He didn't, for reasons I discussed with some of his colleagues at the time. They, they thought that it was being too difficult legally. They'd be subject to legal challenge at the European courts or something. David Cameron, whenever he wanted to sound tough, said, we're going to ban his butter here. Mark my words. He didn't ban them. James Cleverly, to give him credit, the current Home Secretary has. And I think that he deserves credit for that. Tom Tuggenhut, security minister, just signed that into law a few days ago. Mm -hmm. But I regard that as being the lowest hanging fruit. I mean, the lowest hanging fruit. Which they've got to show me and others they're going to do something about. Mm. But, uh, I mean, it's pathetic that almost 20 years after the British government first said they'd ban this group, finally a British government does. Ah, oh, can we go at that speed? Well, quite. If that's the, the rate, then we're in trouble. <laughs> yeah, and, you know, by the way, there's a technical thing that's worth mentioning, because I haven't said this before. There's a technical thing that's very interesting about the British approach to this, which is the British police for about 20 years 
have taken the view that you shouldn't do things on camera, as it were. You shouldn't do things that make a situation potentially worse. So in 2006, when the Danish cartoons uh, of Muhammad were published, 2005 they were published, the Danish cartoons of Muhammad, and all, you know, all the frothing maniacs around the world went bonkers about Denmark, and you know, suddenly everyone was talking about this poor, wonderful, but small country of five million people, and they were the eye of a real whirlwind. Yeah. Um, uh, there was this protest outside the Danish embassy in London in 2006, and people had placards saying, behead those who insult Islam and other charming charming bits mm. of, uh, of information. And um, the police did nothing. In fact, the only thing, person they did threaten that day was a, literally a white van driver who stopped, and he said to the police, what, what the fuck, mate? Are they, mm. They're doing this? And the police said, get in your car or we'll arrest you. So that was the one thing the police did that day. Now, in the weeks and months subsequently, they used the 2006 Glorification of Terrorism Act to try and, in some cases, to imprison the people who were inciting terrorism on the streets of London that day. I still get sent, Winston, those photos by people around the world saying, look, look what's happening on the streets of London. And I say, well, this is actually, you know, 17 years ago now. But the world doesn't know that. And the world doesn't know, and very few British people would even know, that actually the police in the end did move in. It's the same thing with the Luton protests, when in, what was it, 2009 or so, the second uh, battalion of the Anglian Regiment came for a homecoming parade in Luton, were barracked by a load of jihadists on the streets of Luton. Locals were understandably very annoyed that these guys, were ins these jihadists were insulting our troops, and the police protected the jihadists. And then we got the English Defence League and Tommy Robinson and so on from that, exactly mm, from mm. that occasion. And in more recent times, I mean, there was an occasion when about 100 guys from uh, Al Mujah Haroon, which was subsequently banned, uh, accosted me in the streets in London. Mm. And um, uh, I noticed as it got rather nasty that the, there were police who got to the scene and they were hanging back taking photographs. And in the subsequent days, colleagues and others were taken in for questioning by the police to identify people in the, in the crowd who were surrounding me. Um, Subsequently, some of them were arrested, but they were arrested because one of them, or well, a group of them, were turned out were plotting a Mumbai-style attack on the London Stock Exchange. Um, some of them had a hit list of prominent figures in British public life, which I can't name who was on it, but um, they were planning to uh, murder. Mm. Um, uh, one of the killers of Lee Rigby was there. Mm. Um, so I. And they've done this subsequently. They've done this in the London protests. They hang back and they take photographs of Hizbut Tahir saying, rise up, Muslim armies. Mm. And they, they take photographs and then they move in later. They don't realize the optics of this. Mm. They think they're being so clever, the police. And I'm not, I'm not a professional policeman, but I can tell this. This is a horrible policy. Because first of all, you have the horrible optics going not just around Britain, but around the world that say, look at what a pushover the Brits are. Yeah. Secondly, you incite increasing rage among the normal public. What's ha what the hell is happening on our streets? Where the hell are the police? And so you get the, the Islamists get more bold the public get more disenfranchised or just fatalistic. Internationally, everyone sees Britain looking appalling. I would love a baton charge at them. I would love to see the British police. I'd love to borrow some police from Paris mm. and for them to go in and arrest them all on site, drag them off to the cells there and then. That would be great for Britain. But not that it's all about this community policing. We've got to keep the communities on side. Well, you know what? If, if there's going to be so much uproar over arresting people on the streets calling for Muslim armies to arise and to attack, well, that tells us something too. And maybe it's time we learned that. Maybe we should learn that earlier rather than later.
And the, the police are perfectly capable of a baton charge. Oh, I've seen yeah. them do it against white working class groups that come into London. Oh, oh um, the, the Metropolitan Police are fantastic at baton charges. When, for instance, there's a protest against the murdered woman, Sarah Everard. Hmm. Oh, I mean, wow, did the police move in there at that candlelit vigil for a murdered woman who was actually murdered by a policeman mm. off duty. Wow, the police knew how to act then. Mm. Great work, guys. Mm. I mean, maybe we, should, maybe we should say that we spotted Hizbut Tahir and uh, various other jihadists having a candlelit vigil for a young woman. Maybe that's how they'd move in. I want to ask you about multiculturalism. Catherine Burble Singh's Michaela School is currently going to the high courts. Mm. She's being sued by Muslim students who were forbidden from paying. Students with a legal aid, I should say, of 100,000, at least 100,000 uh, pounds behind them. Burble Singh's Where did school, that come from, by the way? Hmm, well, quite. Just like the UN, we're paying for it. Uh, the school's rated. I, I, don't, I, I haven't been to Michaela's school. I've been. I, I have, yes. I've been a couple of times. It's a superb school. I sh we should probably just explain the nature of the school. because Yeah, well, you'll do a better job than yeah. me. Well, so uh, in, in the last decade, uh, the Conservatives set up something similar to the charter school system in the US, where um, it, because state education, like private education, frankly, in the UK and the US is so abysmal these days, um, uh, they wanted to imp improve school, school choice. And there were these things called free schools, like charter schools in the US. And, and parents, it's not about fee paying. It's about the parents selecting the school and the money that the government pays for that child going with them to that school. But it gives parents a choice of the type of school that their mm -hmm. child will be sent to. Now, if you go to the Michaela Academy, as I have done, you will see like, one of the very few hopes we have in our country. Okay, I mean, this is, every child is from a, Almost every child is from an immigrant background. Almost every child is from a poor background. They are getting, being given the best start in life anyone could have. Mm -hmm. They're getting a better start in life than kids at Eton or Harrow or Winchester. The education at this school is superb, and it's because of the ethos, and it's because of the ethos of Catherine Burblesing, which is um, about discipline about respect but earned respect it's about working hard motivation um the children behave beautifully they learn beautifully they're taught amazingly and they've had results that are unbelievable mm -hmm. the the exam results of this school are so extraordinary that they've already gone to the top of the league now, just quickly, Catherine Burbleting has done that in the face of all opposition from the Labour Party, from left-wing councils. People, one building she wanted to buy was sold by the local council for less than she was offering when she was starting the school because they didn't want to sell it to her school. Why did she, they take such umbrage with her? Because she would show them up. Mm. She would show them up. The teaching unions and everyone else in America and in Britain and elsewhere, they are so shown up when somebody comes along and says, actually, it's not a matter of more money. Mm. It's not a matter of bigger pensions for teachers. It's a matter of excellence and the right type of discipline and education. And this school has been the subject of more attack. I mean, literally people handing out leaflets at the gates mm. to try to intimidate pupils, children. So it seems like the case to me is one of, she is attempting assimilation. So she has all the kids saying, God save the, the king in yeah. the morning. Uh, they all eat vegetarian food because there's all different religions. There's Muslims, mm -hmm. there's Hindus, uh, and there's Christians. So it's the way that they can break bread together. It's all yes. designed intentionally so that they can be together. So also is, as I've said, Praying is banned. Now, for me, this is... Banned. A... Banned? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I thought you said bad. Banned. Said Sorry, banned. banned. Yes. yes. Although I would say God Save the King, a hymn, but sort of a prayer. It's a national anthem, yeah. If, if it was a Christian prayer, do you think it should be banned also? And, okay, well, let's put it a different way. The French style 
mm. where you can't wear a burqa or even a crucifix in public buildings. It's an, it's this kind of secular attempt to deal with yes. the multiculturalism. Yeah. So this Burbel Singh's doing a version of that. Is yes. the, is this the correct route to, well, well, to, to addressing that, that problem? Well, just to finish that bit, the reason why this case is so egregious is because the school is a secular school. Mm -hmm. Okay. It is a secular school. There isn't a prayer room for Christians and a prayer room for Muslims and a prayer room for Hindus and, and there aren't religious holidays celebrated. When a parent sends their child to the school, as I understand it, they sign up to the rules of the school. And if they didn't like them, you can go elsewhere. Mm -hmm. you, when, when a child is signed up for a school, it is a contract. Both sides agree to it. This child, any other child, knows what they're going to. They're going to a secular school. And it's a very sensible thing to my mind that Catherine Burble Singh did, because if you don't take the secular approach in an area like the one she's in, and you're starting from scratch, you will be subject to every religion and denomination mm -hmm. making its own demands. And before you know it, you're not getting edu any education done because you're spending the whole darn time arguing about things that mm -hmm. shouldn't be argued about in school. So, and this is a totally egregious case because the pupil and her parents knew what they were signing up to and they have deliberately, mm. in my view, used this as a wedge issue against a very successful secular school and they know what they're doing. And by the way, um, Muslims and others have done this in a lot of places. They push, push, push against the secularism and they make more and more demands and they're never demands for the Hindus, they're never demands for the Christians, and so on. I would say that if, if a child of a Christian family insisted on having a Christian prayer room in a school they knew had been set up to be secular, the same should apply. No, mm -hmm. we're a secular school. If you and your parents, and it's always the parents, of course, if your parents want this to become a non-secular school, go to a different school. But it's different in different places. There are Christian schools. One of the few things the Church of England still does is run a lot of Church of England schools. If you go to a Church of England school, you shouldn't be surprised if there are... Well, actually, these days you would be surprised if there's anything Church of England about it. But anyway, <laughs> you shouldn't be surprised if there was something Church of England about it. Same thing with Catholic schools. Mm -hmm. If you go to a Catholic school, you sign up to a Catholic school, don't be surprised if there's some Hail Marys somewhere along the way. I, I mean, that's the deal. So this is, this. The, the, uh, people don't realize, they realize in France, they don't realize in Britain, this is a very specific tactic. Always to go in like this, create the wedge in which you push your religion through. Mm -hmm. and, and I would argue Britain is in a weaker place than France about that because we have a complex, well, every country has a complex situation with religion. Um, but France has a very clear one. Which, whatever your views, it's been clear since 1905. And um, what do you think about in, in England religious schools? So, be they Muslim schools, Jewish schools, mm. where it's a Christian nation still, although now a minority Christian, mm. it's still a, we're still a Christian nation. Mm. Do you think that there should be Muslim schools, Jewish schools, and Christian schools? Well, this is a really hard one actually because the the, the the way I would say it is, you start from where we are. Um, the, one of the extraordinary things about France is that every now and then it reboots itself, and you know, the Second Republic becomes the Third Republic, and the Third Republic the Fourth, and perhaps the Fourth or Fifth. And you know, um, we don't do that in Britain. I mean, the nature of common law and the nature of of laws continuing by precedent, and and we have a we just have a different history with religion. And, you know, I, I think you sort of have several options in front of you. One is to, to try to start again from day one. I think that would be very hard in Britain. You know, we are where we are. I mean, in Northern Ireland, there's still problems with Catholic and Protestant schools and so on. And, you know, our, our islands have had a complex religious history, as I say, like everywhere. I mean, I would like 
the predominantly schools in Britain to be advocating the the laws and the culture of Britain. I would actually like everyone in the country to have an understanding of where we've come from. I I was rather sad to put it no stronger to see that at the coronation there were certain politicians who couldn't sing the hymns. Mm. Um, that's. Did you feel good about the different religions being represented in that was in yeah i thought that was rather tastefully done in the end i thought you know greet them at the end or you know have have that moment where they all take a part fine it's a way for britain to adapt to the era we found ourselves in because of mass migration Hmm. um it was a rather british compromise solution but the the service was a you know full-on christian service as it quite rightly should be um uh, you get into a tricky terrain with, I mean, if if there were other denomination, if there were any denominations that were teaching basically separation from the state, then I would not be in favor of that. Broadly speaking, I, I think Muslim schools teaching Islam as, as a school ideology is not a good idea because I think it encourages segregation. Um, so not for the content itself, but just for the fact that it's different. From I think it's the, different. The British I mean, worldview. Yeah, and I, I think it ghettoizes Muslims who are already ghettoizing themselves to a great extent in the UK. Um, you know, then people say, "Well, what about Jewish schools and so on?" I, I don't see Jewish schools in the UK as being anything other than, in most cases, centres of some excellence. You know, and I wouldn't want to stop those schools because, I mean. Why should everyone have to pay a price for one particular religion having problems? And it does. Islam has problems. Um, bigger problems than other religions. Have other religions had problems in the past? You bet. <laughs> Do you think Islam's compatible with British values? Islam the religion? Yeah. Well, first of all, not, I'm not ducking the question, but first of all, you have to say, what are British values? Mm-hmm. And I think British values are currently morphing. and They've morphed in our lifetime. I knew what they were very clearly when I was growing up. Um, Again, I mean, we all knew the hymns. We knew the stories and the songs of our country. We knew the legends of our country. Now, because of mass migration, we have to do things like, well, British identity is about being kind and tolerant, saying that um, diversity is our strength, Mm. for instance. This sort of mouthwash. and. Uh, and you know so if you say is Islam compatible with British values I say British values as they are at the moment and as they're evolving probably but Islam the religion makes extremely big claims for itself as all religions do but um, is also in our society and in societies around the world a, 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 a religion which has a lot of desire to assert itself um, it isn't actually these days Catholics who are making the kind of push hmm. that is happening at Catherine, Bur- Catherine Burblesing's school. It's, it's Muslims. Mm-hmm. There have been cases when there was one case with a theater that was putting on a play some years ago that was seen as being a bit uh, anti-Hindu, and there were some Hindus who took an umbrage about that and tried to close the play down. I deprecate that. Um, but it's mainly Islam that's doing the running at the moment in all Western societies and feels that it has the wind behind it, certainly the strength, and it partly does so through a method of intimidation, which I find intolerable, which is basically, I mean, I don't know if you saw that case recently in North England where there was a poor boy, how old was he? He sounded like 12, and he was accused of um, damaging a Quran. And in this obscene bit of footage, the the leadership of the school, the local police chief, and some imams all sat Mm. at a long table in front of the cameras, explained that they were trying to address the problem and that they were trying to address the problem in a peaceful way. And so I go, I'm sorry, this is a kid. This is just a white kid in Britain who suddenly, like before the judges of Islam, with and there was a police chief, typical supine sod, 
sitting there nodding along with the elders of Islam at the table, you know, we're all trying to do everything to pacify community relations. Sorry, community relations, a book got scuffed, mm. not for the first time in a British school, the books got um, scuffed yeah. around the edges. And this kid is at the center of a potential nightmare, just like um, the, 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 the teacher in Batley. Yeah. The teacher in Batley, who showed um, uh, one of the Mohammed cartoons, as I understand it, in a discussion and a debate in his class about... He's still in hiding. He's still in hiding. Yeah. And that school didn't stand by him. Mm -hmm. And the police didn't stand by him. And when those bearded thugs turned up outside, they should have been arrested. They were engaged in intimidation. But you know, I've seen this as a pattern all my life. People are really vulnerable to a tiny bit of physical threat. Really vulnerable. I remember discussing this once with a friend who was much involved in, in the Iraq war. And uh, I was with him in Iraq and I said, What's, uh, what are the things that have surprised you, as it were, about how badly this has gone? And he said, one of the things I just underestimated was we could have troops on a street, but if a man opened an alcohol shop in Baghdad, say, and a local Islamist militia came by one evening and said, you're going to shut this down, it would be shut down. Mm. Like even the law of American troops being around was not as strong as a local militia. Think of the way that's happened all of our lives. A little bit of physical threat. It's an old mob tactic. This is what a lot of um, Islamists have done. They say things like, I get this all the time from these blowhards. They're all like, well, I'm not going to kill you, but I can't promise my, mm. you know, I'm holding my mate here back. And um, I don't like that tone of voice, and I won't be spoken to in it. Um, but a lot of people are very intimidated by that. You know, Nice publishing house you've got here. Shame if anything happened to it. Mm. Nice school you've got here. Shame if anything happened to it. Mm. Sorry, sorry. Are we being? Are we? Are we going to be intimidated by mobs, or thugs, or mafia-like gangs? We. I don't think we would if it was an Italian mafia. So why should we if it is, is an Islamist mafia? No, I mean, where did the? This is a really, really important point to make, if I may. Because the British public, like so many Western publics, are so demoralized. And I want to say to them, man up, stand up, have some damn pride in yourself. What happened to you? What happened to you? We were strong. We were powerful. We were principled. And we weren't easily pushed around. The British public were not easily pushed around. And we were quiet about it. But when we were pushed too far, we did something about it. Now, when did we become this so easily pushed around that the police can be pushed around? One year it's take the knee. One year it's just stand back as people are screaming in your face at an anti-Israel protest in London. One mm. year it's sit on the imam advisory board of the local primary school whilst this poor boy is being made to suffer like this through a struggle session. What's happened to you? What's happened to you, Britain? You know, it's, it's just horrible to see the really great virtues of the British public just being whittled away at and our good decency taken advantage of time and again. What happened to us? Mm. Well, I know what it is. It's been beaten down. And in some cases, some people, it's been beaten right out of them. Well, not me and not millions of others. Not us. Sounds like you've got the Strange Death of Europe Part 2 draft right there. <laughs> Douglas, I want to end on a more wholesome tone. You've got a beautiful uh, column at the Free Press, where oh. you write about poetry. I know it's one of your mm. great loves. We are in the Holy Land. Israel is deep in the British imagination. Mm. It's, it's, in the, it's in the hymns we sing. 
uh, it's the poetry, whether it's Blake. Uh, mm. um, I was reading G.K. Chesterton's mm. uh, book on Jerusalem uh, or, or him coming from England to Israel in 1920, coming mm. in. What does it mean to you? What's the, what does this holy land mean to you? Gosh. When you first come here, as I did some 20 years ago now, uh, it's extraordinary. And it's extraordinary for lots of reasons. One is everything is so visceral and everything rings. Um, I remember I uh, first time I was here and I flew over the valley where David slew Goliath. Mm. I remember the feeling in Jerusalem the first time I was there somebody gave me directions to get to somewhere I think it was the Church of the Holy Sepulchre I said oh you take a right at the Via Dolorosa mm. Mm. that's better than you take a left at Hammersmith Broadway <laughs> <laughs> um I remember once saying to somebody, the beautiful church, Palestinian Christians actually, that have been built nearby. It was the first church for a while to be built in this particular area. And I said to somebody, um, I said to one of the locals who had finished building the church, I said, what's the name of the church? He said, the Church of the Transfiguration. I said, that's a wonderful name. Why did you choose that? He said, well, in the, the, the Holy Land here, we tend to name churches after the site of the nearest biblical story, and the Transfiguration happened there. <laughs> And um, I could give a thousand stories like that. It's, it's an incredibly powerful land because you know it's a place where something happened. Mm. Um, and whether you're a believer or a non-believer, it's, it's, of course, in some ways, it's sometimes powerful in a particular way more for a believer. But even for a non-believer or a doubter like me, um, uh, it's just filled with resonances and and power and um uh, reverberations i mean um i once came back from a conflict here and i remember i slipped into even song in a cathedral which i was nearby and um the one of the the first lesson was included just by chance it was just that day it was a uh, you know, and lo, the peoples of Syria did wage war upon the Israelites. <laughs> well, I've seen that again recently. <laughs> um, and it's, it's enormously powerful for that reason, um, among others. If, if there are other reasons, and there are many, too many really to list, one is I see this as being uh, uh, a country which is a triumph of, as my late friend Jonathan Sachs once said, it's, it's, it's a triumph of, he said, probability over possibility. Possibility mm -hmm. over probability, that was it. Um, it's, it's a country that has, I mean, there's been obviously 3,000 years of claim to this land by the Jewish people, and it's the only place they really have as home. And I mind, by the way, very much the, and I know, I know what they're doing, the enemies of this country. I know those people who think they're doing good, but you know, you think this is the only place in the world where Jews are actually safe. Mm. Why? Because it's the only place where they're allowed to defend themselves. Mm. And the lesson of history is the Jews can't give their defense to anyone else. If you go to the ghetto in Venice or you, go to the various scenes of atrocities across Europe, particularly in Central and Eastern Europe, you know that the Jews can never again, ever, be in a position where their, secur their security and their safety is in the hands of anyone but themselves. Hmm. And that's a very powerful and important thing. And when people say, oh, I'm not singling out Israel, sorry, mate, you are. Yeah. You just are. It's the one place the Jews are allowed to defend themselves. You are mm. singling them out. And so it's that. 
I felt it coming here, the journey leaving London and seeing all the torn hostage posters everywhere, all the whole journey, all the way to the Disgusting. airport. Disgusting. And then coming here and the hostage posters are oh. untouched. Yeah. And there's graffiti says, fuck Hamas. Mm. And I always thought that England was a safe place for Jews. Now, I know we've, there's moments of history where it's not been a safe place for Jews, but it's a hell of a lot better than what happened on the continent or in Russia mm -hmm. or in anywhere else in the world. Mm. Um, maybe America was better. But uh, coming here, I, I, well, at, in this moment, I don't feel that way about England. I'm many Jews mm. who are terrified in England. Mm. And so I absolutely agree with you that this is the only safe place for Jews. And, and it's the place where the Jews will fight, and they have to. And um, my view is that they, it's, it's quite wrong for other people to tell them how they should fight mm. and how they should survive. I mean, as I said, I said to you at the beginning, you know, if you go up to the hills in Judea and Samaria, the West Bank, the place we're sitting in is visible. Mm. And if the West Bank was handed over in its entirety to the Palestinians, the place we're sitting in would be being shelled right now. Mm. Now, when people say, how dare they have an occupation in the West Bank? It's not an occupation, first of all. But secondly, if it was, that's why. Mm. And... You know, I was speaking to an Israeli friend the other day about, um, we had a wonderful evening just talking books and history and Israeli politics and Israeli history. And we got onto the subject of one of my favorite authors, Stefan Zweig. And uh, mm. Zweig, uh, Zweig, of course, committed suicide in 1943 in Brazil, which was the last place he was able to run to mm. on his flight from the Nazis. Um, I had a friend who met him in London in 1938, and he didn't, he couldn't stop in London. He had to keep going. Mm. Um, and he ended up committing suicide in 43 with his wife. And I've often wondered about that. Now, it, it, if you read his autobiography, the development von Gestern, the, the, the World of Yesterday, you'll see, uh, in a way, it was in well, like Primo Levi, it's impossible to think of how you mm. could survive after what you've been through. But, I mean, Zweig saw his books burned early, you know. And Once your books are burned when you're an author and you mm. can't be read and you can't be published, uh, you're sort of dead in a way. It's mm. a pre-death death. death. Mm. And, but I was speaking to this friend about this and he said the problem for Zweig was that he wasn't a Zionist. He... He met Herzl, mm. Theodor Herzl. It's a very interesting description of his meeting with Herzl in the world of yesterday. But he didn't ever sign up completely with Herzl's vision of the reestablishment of the Jewish state. Was he against it? or it... Very it complex, new... okay. a very complex story. But he was a Viennese Jew whose world had been completely burned and who saw it coming. And that's one of the worst things. He saw it coming mm -hmm. and he could do nothing to stop it. Mm -hmm. But I understand in a way now why he did it because his was a life entirely without hope, in a, in a world without hope, even though the war was turning by that point, turning against the Nazis. Um, but he had no long-term hope. And this country is a long-term hope mm. see it's 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 where history meets the future it's it's where worlds meet uh, i mean this this country it gets so much attention in part because there's always this thing of like how the hell did the jews manage to make such a thriving vibrant successful state out of people from all across the Middle East and North Africa and the diaspora returning and Ashkenazi and Sephardi and, and, and how did they form this state that, that's blossomed so much and let alone compared to its neighbors and the one darn re place in the region that doesn't have any oil, mm. you know? Um, and, and it's just to me an amazing testament to what, human beings can do with faith and hope. And then there's that thing, of course, which uh, Joe Biden has a story of Golda Meir, who's back in the news a bit at the moment because of the movie, uh, 
um, Joe Biden has quite a nice story for Joe Biden um, about the one time I think he met Golden Bear when the first time he was here, first time he came. And he's been good in this conflict, actually, Joe Biden. That's an old school Democrat, actually. They, they get this. They know this. Some of the younger ones are idiots. But, the, but this the, the, would be when she was prime minister. This was um, probably just after. Is he that old? <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> he, he could have met Weizmann. Um, <laughs> um, uh, 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 he, um, but he has a rather lovely story that he says Golda Meir at some point you know, sort of took him by the arm and he was there talking about Israel's defense and, and what the threats were and so far, forth. forth. And, um, and Golda Meir apparently said to, took, him by, took Joe Biden by the arm and she said, um, well, you know, we have a secret weapon. And uh, he thought she was going to say it. Yeah. And he said, well, what's that? She said, we have nowhere else to go. And, um, you know, if the enemies of this country had their way, and I am not using hyperbole at all here, if the enemies of this country had their way, they would finish the job of Adolf Hitler. Okay? It's as serious as that. It's as serious as that. The people chanting from the river to the sea in London and other places, whether they know it or not, would be finishing the job of Adolf Hitler. Mm. I sometimes think to myself, if, if these people who, who do that ever got their way, I would pity them mm. because they would one day wake up and realize they were the Nazis. They were the ones who did it. They were the ones who, after the Jews, were chased out from all of the other countries in this region and were slaughtered by the millions in Europe, then destroyed the Jewish state. Mm. So I hope to God those people never get their way for lots of reasons. But I don't think they will because the thing you see in this country at the moment, I spoke to a guy the other day who said... Um, now is an old, older Israeli guy in his sixties, a workman, and got chatting. And he said, "I owe the um, I owe the younger generation in Israel an apology." And I said, "Why?" Oh, it's incredibly moving. He said, um, "I thought for years, and I said for years, the younger generation spend all their time on TikTok, Instagram, and their." flippant, they're frivolous, they just want to go out partying in Tel Aviv, you know, blah, blah, blah. They're not like the previous generations. He said, I owe, owe them an apology. October the 7th happened. They all went and fought. They enlisted, over-enlisted, was 140% enlistment straight after October the 7th. And if you speak to the people, I've spoken to a lot of them, soldiers fighting, or the families of soldiers who died. And they're all people like you and me, Winston, by the way, except braver. All of them. Mm. I was at the home the other day of a young woman who was 23. She'd um, had some friends who were at the Nova party. She wasn't there herself. Mm. Immediately after the 7th, she insisted on enlisting. And her parents asked her not to, said she didn't have to, she could do other things, she could volunteer and so on. And she enlisted. And on the 12th, she went down to Sterot. Um, and uh, I've been many times and she went down and there was an air raid as it happens all the time in Sterot, uh, missiles fired from Gaza. She got out of her car as is a protocol and one of the missiles landed on her. And she was a photographer. And um, uh, this, story, this country is filled with thousands and thousands of stories like this. But here's the thing. These are young people like you and I, or you and I used to be. But they've all stepped up. And they've all stepped up for their country and for their people. And that's why I say, you know, I, I, I look at these people. I speak to these people, I listen to these people. And I think your contemporaries in America and Britain are wasting their lives 
You know, there was a young girl of 21 I was with at a dinner the other week, and she turned out to be an expert on the Yemen, intelligence expert. And I just said to her, your contemporaries in America are being expensively educated into ignorance and malice. And you're a real person. You're a real person. Wow. It's been amazing coming here and seeing everyone. I thought leaving Britain, and I've spent a lot of time in America, as everywhere where there's such disunity and division, and encouraged, you know, under the, whether it's because of diversity or whatever reason, but whatever, we're fr massively fractured. And uh, with all our attention on this country and this conflict, I expected coming here would be coming to the storm. And it's unbelievably calm here because mm. everyone, uh, then, then they're suffering. But they're all focused mm. and they all know that they have an ob objective and they all have the humility to find mm. their their part to play in that. It's mm -hmm. it's been absolutely astonishing. I, it's I've inspiring, never seen isn't like it? it? It's deeply, deeply inspiring. Because it's always that question, would we step up? Would we do it? And for us it's still a hypothetical. Pray God it is always a hypothetical for us in Britain and in America and the rest of the West. Not a hypothetical here. Mm. They've been tested again. And they haven't been found wanting at all. They've been weighed in the balance and found to be magnificent. And that's why the world shouldn't be thinking, why, why doesn't Israel behave more like the rest of the world? In my view, the rest of the world should be thinking, why aren't we more like Israel? And the final thought on that, it's because Israel lives in reality. Israel lives in history. And what I mean by that is not just the past. I mean in that events are going on all the time. In Britain and in the West in general, we live in this post-historical dream still, where there are no enemies, where the jungle isn't there. And you can't afford that here. Mm. Here, the people who are down the road from us having drinks tonight and dancing aren't dancing in a trance. Mm. They know that they're only dancing because their brothers and sisters and friends tonight are fighting Hamas in Gaza and are standing guard at the northern border and are patrolling in the West Bank. So you can't take it for granted here, and they don't, but they still live. Mm. And that's, that's the final just wonder of this country and its people in my mind, is it goes back to that very beginning, the first commandment, choose life. Choose life that you and your descendants might live. That's what they're doing every day. On that note, Douglas Murray. Thank you so much for speaking with me. Absolute pleasure. Been a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you for watching the Winston Marshall Show. If you enjoyed that episode, well, I encourage you to like, share, and subscribe. You can also find us on all podcast outlets if you want just the audio. And, of course, on winstonmarshall.co.uk. Thanks for listening.